Hello everyone, welcome to the seventh lecture on deep learning. Today we're going to be looking in particular at energy-based models. So up until this point, we've taken quite a statistical view on learning, like through, say, the eyes of Christopher Bishop or Ian Goodfellow. But with energy-based models, we're going to look at learning through the lens of differentiable geometry. Jan LeCun, who's one of the forefathers of this field, very much likes to think this way. And if you watch a lot of his talks, you'll see he likes to sort of wave his arms emphatically and yell at the audience in a French accent about the big mistake GANs make when they don't think of the energy landscape. So in this lecture, we're going to formally define some of the more geometric terms and try and raise a sort of new way of thinking through thinking of the geometry of learning. So we're going to start by formally defining manifolds, and then we're going to formally define energy-based models and see how pretty much most machine learning tasks can actually be thought of as an energy-based model. So just some examples, GANs in particular are just energy-based models, if you think of them uh, as one. And even things like clustering algorithms, which perhaps you looked at last, last year, can actually also be thought of as energy models. Uh, also, even, even like classifiers or generative models can be viewed as an energy model, if you look at it this way. So we're going to introduce Boltzmann machines by Jeffrey Hinton, which are really nice energy model, uh, and they're also universal function approximators. And then we're going to look at some of the concepts that really drive towards the state of the art. The maths is quite advanced on some of this more recent literature, so self-study will be required if you're interested in pursuing these kind of ideas further, especially if you're looking to use them in your coursework. But at the end of this lecture, you should have a pretty good grasp on the very state of the art of generative modeling. Uh, and you should also have a more kind of geometry focused rather than a purely statistical focused perspective. Uh, and this will give you a way to actually imagine the learning problem. So often if you're doing research in this area, area um, you want to have some kind of way to visualize what's actually happening. And this lecture should help produce these kind of visualizations. So now we're going to start by how do we build this more geometric view of learning. And to do this, we're going to first introduce the definition of a manifold. So imagine I was giving this to a lecture with, you know, an actual lecture with lots of people in this room. You can imagine a room full of people, a big, big lecture theatre full of people. Now imagine uh, collecting a data set where we've got people's faces. So we've I've just gone around and taken a picture of everyone's face, and that's our data set. And then we're going to just train a classifier to say detect whether people are happy or sad, or or, or maybe there's some output from a neural network which is just like. What, what 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 type of the face it is? Maybe it could have some features as well, such as uh, their gender, or it could have their age as well. As things we're trying to have the neural network predict. So the input is faces, and the output is the uh, result of the, some classif classification or regression. So a very simple feed for a neural network. So what you might one way to think of this problem of learning is to imagine that all of these faces fall. A, are very high dimensional points. So each pixel in the pixel of a face um, represents a dimension of, of, of the input points. So the points could be say a thousand dimensional if they've, if, if they've got say 10, 24 pixels in there. Um, so what we, so you imagine you've got these very high dimensional points and actually what you can do is you can think of these points as being points on some surface, some, some like, I don't know, I've got a piece of paper here. Um, if you sort of scramble it up and imagine the points, if I was to draw some dots on this piece of paper, just draw some blue dots on it, you can imagine each blue dot being one of these images of a, of a face. Um, so, but try and imagine this in like a higher dimensional space. So, so all of these faces or points of data uh, actually belong to some, some large surface. Um, this is what we're going to call the manifold, this surface. And basically, you can now sort of see how there are other points on this surface which aren't in the data set but are still valid faces. So th this surface represents the entire space of all faces. And and so now we can. This this is kind of what a manifold is. It's it's like a a, a surface containing where where individual points on that surface are are samples from our data set. And often what we want to do in learning is we want to kind of slowly unwrap or flatten this piece of paper into a, into a simpler form, into a, a nice new piece of paper that we can understand and read um, rather than having that crumpled up mess. So we want to transform the data, transform or warp and unwrap this surface into a 
a simpler surface which we can uh, just understand like it could just directly contains the features in the x coordinates for example so that's a kind of conceptual view now let's look at a more mathematical view so formally speaking a manifold is a topological space that locally resembles euclidean space so formally an n-dimensional manifold has a neighborhood that is homeomorphic uh, to an n-dimensional Euclidean space. So basically you can split up an n-dimensional manifold into patches where each patch locally resembles a Euclidean space. So 1D manifolds include lines and circles. So maybe I'll just flip to my notes here and we can have a look. Right, so I'm just going to draw. Um, maybe I'll use a pencil. This is this is an example of a one-dimensional manifold. And locally, if we split this up into patches, so if we take a a, a local region of this one-dimensional manifold, it locally looks like a Euclidean one space. So here's another example: a circle. We can split a circle up into patches, and everywhere we take a patch of it locally, that patch, if we sort of unwrap it, will look like a Euclidean one space. So an example of something which isn't a um, one-dimensional manifold um, might be, say, a figure of eight. So if this is our, if this is a shape, then this is not a one-dimensional, um, a one-D manifold because if we look at the intersection here, if, if we zoom in and take the limit of zooming in on that 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 uh, that crossover part there, it it never looks like a, a single line. There's this intersecting region, so so this doesn't look like uh, a Euclidean one space. If I had like a, a rubber band and um, I've got one here, okay, it's split. Um, but if I if I put this figure of eight in three dimensional space, uh, so I'll try and twist it around. Um, this actually could be a one dimensional manifold embedded in three dimensions because locally, wherever you look on this rubber band, it will actually look like a line because there's not an intersection because there's a gap between the, these crossover points. <clears throat> so two-dimensional manifolds include things like the sphere and the torus. Um, hang on, I'll just flip back to my sl slides. Yeah, two-dimensional manifolds include things like planes and spheres and toruses. Um, and the if you look at the image here, the face part here um, is a two-dimensional manifold that's been embedded in three-dimensional space. So this, you can see how this, this face here locally is two-dimensional. These points are two-dimensional, but they're embedded in this three-dimensional space. So we would say this is a two-dimensional manifold. And we would say this is a, a one-dimensional manifold because it's got, it, it, locally it resembles a one-dimensional Euclidean one space. So you can project points in three-dimensional space onto this two-dimensional manifold, which corresponds to, to, um, to points in the two-dimensional Euclidean space. A helix, like a spring, is quite a nice example. Um, a helix, again, if I just draw a helix. Um, so imagine this is like x, y, and z space. So a hel and then we've got some helical spring. Um, so we could say a helix is a one-dimensional manifold embedded in three-dimensional space, just like that elastic band I show you. Because everywhere locally on this helix curve, it will look like a, a Euclidean one space. So you get different hierarchies and types of manifold. You get topological manifolds, and then on, within this you can describe continuous functions. Um, and then you have differentiable manifolds, where you, on, on these types of manifold you can describe differentiable functions. And then you have Riemannian manifolds, um, and these have an inner product defined on their tangent space. So you can describe lengths and depths and angles and volumes. Um, so it's also a different, it's also differentiable and smooth. Uh, you also get statistical manifolds, which are Riemannian manifolds, which describe the space of probability distributions. So I may have used in this description the word embedding, or you might have heard of the word embedding before. Um, but if we have some function phi uh, that maps from a manifold M to a new manifold N in an injective way that preserves its structure, we can call that function an embedding. And typically for differentiable manifolds, uh, the embedding is also differentiable. <clears throat> 
So the example we gave at the beginning, where you had some encoder, um, which started with some manifold of faces in some high dimensional points. And then we also had some other lower dimensional manifold for the outputs. Um, we would say that this is actually a nice example of an embedding function. So it takes as input that, that manifold of images, M, in some, some high dimensional space. And then it, it warps that space in a, in a nice differential way to output points on some new manifold N. So basically manifolds allow us to imagine the geometry of the whole space of inputs. We sort of zoom out from looking at how individual parts are transformed to thinking about uh, all the inputs, the entire space of possible inputs, the entire space of possible outputs. Okay, so now let's move on to energy models. Energy, energy models are not really a new idea. They're really just any function that is happy when you give it actual data, um, but it's not happy when you give it as input something which doesn't look like real data. So when you input x, or x is real data sampled from the data set, uh, then the model tries to output a zero, uh, which we say is good. We say outputting a zero is a good thing. But when you try to give it something that doesn't look like data, it should output a value greater than zero. And we say that's a bad thing. And typically, the, the greater than zero, or the higher the value it is, then the, the less likely it is, the less it looks like real data. And pretty much every machine learning algorithm can actually be thought of this way or defined this way. So it's a very generic and encompassing term. So if I just switch down to my notes again, Let's just say we have like a classifier, for example, and we'll see how we can think of a classifier this way. We could say we have some, some model, which we're going to call E, like a deep neural network. And the deep neural network takes as input uh, x, our x's. Um, and this could be like, say, uh, an image of a horse, horse image. And we also have some label as input, uh, say, y. Some, some ground truth label. So this could be uh, a horse label. This could be our prediction, actually, of the, of the network. Um, and we basically want the loss or the uh, these two things to match. We want uh, the output of the model to be 0. So <clears throat> this is basically what the loss function, including a neural network and all of its parameters, does. The loss is high when your predicted label doesn't match the correct label. So if this was a, a dog label and this was a horse image, then you would want the loss to be a high value, greater than zero. So normally, what would you do in this case? <clears throat> well, normally what you would do is you would update your predicted label. You would change the prediction of this function, the output of the neural network. Um, and you would change it via gradient descent to match the correct label. So we would make these match by changing y here. But we could actually do something else. Um, what we could do is we could optimize x instead. We could change the image. So we could do our gradient descent on the image to minimize this loss. Um, and we could optimize x to make it compatible with the zebra, sorry, with the horse label. And this, then this loss would minimize too, and it would be correct. So we could change, we could either change our output y, or we could change our inputs to match whatever the, the, the label was here. And this is a bit like what um, Deep Dream does. So I'm not sure if you've heard of uh, Google Deep Dream, but if I just uh, show an image from it. This, this is basically doing just that. They, they have this massive classifier. Um, I'm not sure if you can see that. Maybe I'll switch to my um, slides. So Google takes this huge classifier network um, trained on many, many classes. And then they change the, they do gradient descent on the inputs to match one of the network's output classes. So in this case, it's the dog label. And um, basically, this basic tra changes all of the inputs, every single pixel, to make it more dog-like. And the deep neural network has lots of convolutional uh, layers, which are spatially invariant. So it basically tries to put dog-like features at all of the different hierarchical layers through the, through the neural network. So every single pixel locally looks the most dog-like. All the intermediate layers look dog-like, and even the high-level abstract layers uh, look like dogs. So it's the most dog-like image you can get. 
So if we just look at the, f the figure here now um, and try to imagine this, given what we've now learned about manifolds, um, you could you can basically set, think of the data manifold as being some continuous line at the at, at, at the solution or at zero basically. So where where this entire function is zero, you can imagine that as the data manifold. And then there's some observations or some samples from that manifold which are shown in red, uh, and that's maybe the data set. These could be your images of cats and dogs or so on. Then the goal of energy-based models is to learn an energy function, which is this whole function shown in blue, um, which is smooth and it, it guides any new samples you get uh, down towards the data manifold, this, this nice continuous line at the, at the bottom of the function. So if we, if we have this function learned this way, we can take any input sampled from any, any, anything we like. It could be sampled from a normal distribution, um, you know, take samples all the way over here and all the way over here. And then we can do gradient descent on the inputs to update them, to make them slide down into the, into the value here uh, onto the data manifold. So that's quite a nice idea, right? Well, actually GANs are just a kind, a kind of form of this. Uh, they're a kind of form of energy-based model. So let's have a look at GANs now with this kind of perspective. So as we said, GANs are also energy models. Specifically, the discriminator is an energy model. So if we look at Ian Good, or if you remember um, Ian Goodfellow's equation, the discriminator basically just says real samples are zero and fake samples are one. Do you remember the discriminator of it? You have the generator function and the discriminator function. The discriminator just basically says where it's real. We set that to one of the values. We're just going to call that value zero for now. Where it's fake, we're going to say it's everything else. So it tries to push the values of the real samples down and it tries to pull the energy up for up to one for any kind of shape samples, for any other kind of type of samples from the generator. And this results in a very kind of steep, not a very smooth function, a very steep energy landscape, where it's basically one everywhere that the generator tries to estimate during training, um, except for the very data manifold here where it's zero. So what does the generator do? Well, given initial points sampled from a normal distribution, um, it basically points that cover all over the energy landscape, the generator tries to learn an embedding function that transforms these points such as they fall into these valley regions here. So the generator constantly tries to estimate where these valley regions are and put points in it. Maybe it gets some of those wrong, but it gets most of them in the valley regions here. And then the discriminator tries to um, um, take the real samples and push them further in and push all of the generated points up to one again does this in a single nonlinear sampling step. So it's, it's very efficient to do. It's not like you need to do lots of gradient descent steps on this. The generator just learns to, to try and find this valley region and put, them, put the points straight into it. Um, as, and as we mentioned previously, instead of using a generator though, what we could also do is, is start with our points somewhere on this energy landscape and we could try to do gradient descent on them to try and work out where, where these valley regions were. Uh, and, and so long as the energy landscape is smooth, like like this, um, that should that approach should work very well. And while this sounds very nice in theory, in practice, people find, in the case of GANs, that the generated points end up creating like adversarial examples for the discriminator. Um, so, if you try and just do it naively or try and just do gradient descent, um, you get these kind of crazy examples which don't really end up looking like. Um, data points, they look more like deep, those deep dream examples, or they just, they, they just start to look quite noisy, they don't look like real data, they just fool the discriminator. So if you, if you do this naively, you end up with just these, you end up just fooling the discriminator because the gradient descent is too powerful, and they not, look nothing like actual data. And arguably the reason for this is that the energy landscape in GANs is, is not very good, it's, it's not smooth. So this is what Jan LeCun likes to talk about. Um, saying how basically this is a lot better and GANs do it wrong. They, they try and carve out this, this non-smooth landscape, which is not very good. So yeah, I've got a couple of questions here. Is this smooth? What does a one Lipschitz discriminator do to the energy landscape? Um, you can remember that one Lipschitz constraint, which tries to make the landscape also look like a, uh, a distance function. So it tries to basically regularize this to look smooth. Um, and you're, but you're still, if you look at the actual loss, 
this is basically what the, the primary GAN objective is trying to carve out, then you, you're adding this extra constraint with a, a one Lipschitz function, which is making it a lot nicer and a lot smoother. But they're still fighting between this, this strong carving out energy landscape and this smooth landscape. So you find this kind of um, this kind of saddle point or some equilibrium between this, this uh, nice smooth landscape and, and this carved out one. So let's just um, also look at some other examples. The energy landscape also has a direct connection with designing optimal clustering algorithms. So the definition of a clustering algorithm, or, or rather just a cluster, is that it's the connected component of a level set of the underlying probability density function over our data observations. Now that's probably quite a lot to take in. So let's just break it down so it makes a bit more sense. So it's the connected component. So I'm assuming most of you have done some kind of image processing before, where maybe you've done some binary image morphology where you have these binary images and you extract the connected components from them. So if you've got lots of like binary images of cells or cancer cells, then the connected components are where all of the white pixels are locally connected or adjacently connected. Um, forming an individual connected component just for every one cell. So you'd have, with, with an image of 10 cancer cells, you would have 10 connected components with white pixels corresponding to each cancer cell. So it's a cluster is a connected component of a level set. Now what's a level set? Well, imagine again, you've got like an image, uh, maybe a grayscale image, and you threshold that image at different levels. So you just select all the pixel values which are greater than say 0.9, then you select all of the pixel, the grayscale pixel values, which are greater than 0 0.8, and they're greater than 0 0.7. You're going to basically get all of these different uh, thresholded regions segmented from that image, uh, and they're, they're your level sets. That's your level set. Um, so it's just thresholding the image at different levels. So a cluster is a connected component. It's one of these. If if, if these are our, our level sets then it's one of these connected components. So here might be one connected component, here might be another connected component of the unknown probability, dis probability density function. So this is the, the probability dis density function we're trying to learn over our observations. This is the, the generative model, or if you like, this is the entire energy landscape that we're trying to compute. So if you can compute all of that, you can actually design an optimal clustering, uh, an optimal algorithm an optimal clustering algorithm. But the problem is that defining the energy landscape and computing the unknown PDF for the data is very expensive. So it's a nice video of this here. I'm just going to briefly play it, um, which I just switch over this. Okay. We can presume that there's some underlying probability density function for the distribution that we're sampling from. So here I've drawn that as a heat map over the data and we can see Samples are less likely to be drawn from some areas. I can convert that to level sets, contours essentially, uh, which I can draw. I can pick out some particular level sets and ask what the connected parts are. And that's easy enough to see in this case. And I can call those my clusters. So we can put all that together and just watch it go. We get our probability density function, we take our level sets, we pick out some particular level sets, and we call those air clusters, and we're done. So is that process a clustering algorithm? Because to be honest, those look pretty good to me. So the answer is no, because we don't know the probability density function. Which level sets do we choose? Well, I managed to do that by knowing the answer in advance and carefully choosing them by hand. So I cheated, uh, and computationally, that's ridiculously expensive to do. You just can't compute all of that. Okay, um, so that's basically if we can compute this probability density function, or if we can estimate it somehow, we can learn this energy landscape, and we can know our level sets, um, we can actually, by the definition of a, what a cluster is, we can actually design an optimal clustering algorithm. So basically, you can see how this energy landscape um, it allows us to, if we can learn it, do things like produce optimal clustering strategies. And if you, if, 
if you've studied some of these clustering algorithms from last year, you'll see how a lot of the methods are just very crude approximations of, of this underlying principle, or this underlying theoretical idea. So take k-means, for example. Um, you start by randomly initializing some centroids, which is a coarse approximation of the data manifold. Um, and then you assign your observations of the data set, your, your actual data examples, to the nearest centroid. And then we have our energy function, which is just the, in the case of k-means, it's just the average distance to the centroids of their assignees. And basically what we're doing is we're fitting the data to the, our data to the manifold, and then we're updating the data manifold. And the manifold is basically naively parameterized as a, a fixed size set of k Euclidean centroids. Uh, and I mean, that's really stupid for most cases. It, it makes a ton of assumptions about the shape of the data manifold, uh, the size, the sparsity of the data. Um, something like a density-based clustering algorithm like dbscan, you can watch more about that in the video if you're interested, or hdbscan. I'm not sure if you've studied them, but they're really machine learning algorithms, so I won't be going into them in this deep learning module. But they're much, much better. They make better approximations for this based on this underlying definition, which, which and they, they, they produce better looking clusters, even though they still make lots and lots of assumptions about uh, the locality and the sparsity and so on. But yeah, with, with um, dbscan, what you do is you initialize, you initially classify your points as being in dense regions on, on, the, on a manifold. So it's just like some nearest neighbor search heuristic. And basically you label data examples which have more than delta neighbors within some small Euclidean distance. So it's like anything which is close to which itself gets, gets labeled together. And, and this basically identifies core points, for example, images which are really, really similar to, to other images in the data set. So it's like a tries to approximate the, the local density. And then what you do is you directly identify connected components by these locally adjacent date dense regions of, of images or data which is really similar to itself. And you construct some kind of graph where you flood through all of the core points, which is allow, which allows you to extract these connected components, uh, which are and when that end up being the clusters. So with with dbscan we make less of an assumption of the shape of the the data manifold than you do with k-means. But the energy landscape is still not very smooth, um, as we basically have this hard threshold where points are considered uh, not containing bit belonging to clusters, or they are. And we also don't have a nice gradient flow to make them more like more data line. So it's a really discrete but fast approximation of this energy modeling problem, and it still suffers from lots of problems. For example, the Euclidean metrics used are well known to suffer from the curse of dimensionality. So as you increase the dimensions of the points. Uh, and at the limit of this behavior of increasing the dimensionality of the points, say 1,000 dimensional points, 10,000 dimensional points, like large images, then the distances in, in Euclidean space all actually tend to the same value. So, so this approximation of using a Euclidean metric uh, actually breaks down and fails as you increase the dimensionality of the data. But it's still good to see and understand like the, the underlying theory of, of how these relate to the, to the energy modeling problem. So before we examine some of the design challenges in energy-based models, I'm going to discuss a little more detail uh, the softmax function. And softmaxes are generally used in the last layer of a neural network where you want some distribution over the outputs. So if you look at the equation here, you'll see that the, fos the softmax function just takes uh, as input some vector z. This could be our input vector z. Um, of k real numbers, and it normalizes it into a probability distribution proportional to the exponentials um, of the input element. So before applying the softmax, some of the vector components can be negative. You can have negatives in here. Um, they can be greater than 1, like here you could have 7.2. And this, this whole thing doesn't necessarily need to sum to 1. But after you apply the softmax function, then every component here in will be in the interval of 0 to 1. There'll be no values greater than 1 in here and, and no values less than 0. To, um, and all of the components here will sum up to 1. They'll, the whole thing will be a, a prob proper probability mass function, so it integrates to 1. And the larger components basically get step put, the, the largest components will get pushed up to, to be near 1 by, based on the exponentials. And, and similarly, all of the smaller components will get pushed down towards 0. So it will try to make one very large uh, component and the rest of them tend to zero. Uh, 
And say you wanted the, this is very useful because say you wanted the last layer of your neural network to represent a probability of the inputs being like a cat, a horse, or a dog. What you do is you do a soft, these, these could be the output neurons. Then you do your softmax over, over, over these. And, uh, and now you've got the class that you're interested in. And softmin is basically the same, but you just negate the vector values both in the numerator and in the denominator. Um, so the smallest values end up with the the smallest values here would end up with the highest probabilities in the output. So now we've defined how we can turn a set of observations into a probability distribution, such as a PDF, a probability density function, or a PMF, a probability mass function. We can express the formal mathematical definition now of an energy-based model or an EBM as in this equation here. And you'll basically see this as a, a soft min. If we just replace our summation with an integral um, and it's not a soft max, we've, we've negated these values, so it's a soft min. This means it prefers the lower uh, input values or the lower energy values uh, as the ones associated with the higher probabilities. So we want, we want the most probable data to be the, the ones with the lowest values. Then as Instead of the discrete case, the sum is replaced with an integral over our entire uh, data set. So to represent this being part of some continuous underlying distribution, like this, this continuous data manifold here. Um, so basically, the data manifold represents a continuous space of all possible images over all of space time. Now, the problem here is that computing the integral here in the denominator is unfortunately intractable. So it would require integrating over all of the possible inputs, um, which is often like an infinite set of x. So for example, if we go back to our analogy of the faces in the room, we would somehow need to integrate over the, the space of every single possible face which could ever exist over all of space time um, if we wanted to just train a face classifier. And that's just impossible to ever get that kind of data. Um, so it's it's is this infinite set and, and we need to do, so we need to do some kind of approximation here, or we need to estimate, um, and, and this is really the, the study of energy models or, or the big problem here is this, this denominator. It's, it's really easy to push real samples down. It's really easy to just sample some data from our data set and push those values down, but it's really, really difficult to, to compute this intractable part of the integral here where we push just the space of every other possible bit of data um, in, in the entire universe over all of space time up. So conceptually, this means we need to just push these, these real samples down. Uh, this is really easy, but we need to push everything else up. And this is the, the tough part as the space of all other non data is very, very, very large and, and much harder to approximate. So in general, there are these kind of contrastive approaches, which drive real samples down. And then they approximate the intractable part by some kind of iterative process to sample the model. So we iteratively take samples from our generative model and then, and then uh, there are these kind of, we try to push those ones up. Uh, and then there are these kind of score, score matching based approaches which address this intractable part by some divergence measure between the model score and the data score. Okay. So, since the denominator in the previous slide is intractable for most models, um, it's, it's typical to use a kind of contrastive divergence in which the energy values of the data samples are pushed down while samples from the energy distribution are, are actually pushed up. So more formally, the gradient of the negative log likelihood loss, so taking a sample from our model, from, sorry, taking a sample from our data set, and we compute the negative log likelihood, um, it has this property as shown in the equation here. So reading this equation, it, it just says that the, um, the gradient of the loss with respect to the parameters of the model theta is the expected value of the energy gradient when pulling a real sample from our data set. And, and this value should increase. Um, and also the expected value of the uh, energy gradient when sampling the model. So this is a, a sample from our model now, not from the data set from our model. Um, this should decrease, hence the, the negative here. And sampling from the joint distribution of the model typically requires some iterative or sequential sampling process, where commonly we define a Markov chain over a sequential over a set of sequential states, and we perform lots and lots of update steps. 
So this is like where we fall down the, the energy landscape. Um, and we iteratively update the Markov chain based on the transition probability from a state to another state, where each state of the Markov chain is obtained by sampling the underlying probability distribution. And two popular iterative ex algorithms for doing this are the uh, Metropolis algorithm and the Gibbs sampling algorithm, which you'll see the details of that in any papers that do this. So I'll, I'll show a couple of, well, I'll show a collab example of doing this in a couple of slides later to hopefully make this a little bit clearer. Okay, so Boltzmann machines, also called stochastic hot field networks with hidden units, are one of the earliest neural networks for modeling binary data. And these are energy-based models, which just have visible units, V1 and V2 here, uh, and hidden units. So normally you have visible units, hidden units, and then output layers, but, but Boltzmann machines don't have the output layers, they just have the visible units and the hid hidden units. So there's no output layers like you get with a feed for on your neural network, like in the discriminator where you've got that output neuron. So instead, the energy is defined globally over the entire network here. And for the actual energy function used, you can refer to Geoffrey Hinton's paper, which is referenced up here. So looking at the first equation here, you'll see, you can see how the probabilities are modeled over the inputs. And the maths is very similar to the softmin or the negated softmax. So it's just a softmax, it's similar to a softmax, but you've got these negated values here and some extra coefficients. Uh, and Boltzmann machines are typically trained via the negative log, li log likelihood through contrastive divergence, as shown in the second equation, um, which shows that we differentiate the log probabilities with respect to the weight matrices. However, there's a big problem with this, which is that the exact computation of the expectations take an exponential amount of time in the number of hidden units. So as you start to have more and more hidden units, then you get this crazy increase in time and it just becomes uh, impractical for, for everything but very, very tiny problems. And even worse than that, um, several people have observed that for the contrastive divergence to perform well, you need kind of exact samples from these hidden units here. Uh, and uh, the exact samples from the hidden units conditional on some values are required. So basically, it also makes these Boltzmann machines very impractical unless you can get really, really high quality data out of it. So restricted Boltzmann machines are the same as Boltzmann machines, but with a restricted graphical structure, so that it's bipartite. And this means that the visible uh, hidden units conditional on the hidden units become independent which makes training these much more straightforward in practice because you've got this um, independence so you can just sample much more easily. You don't need to break it down. And uh, training works by trying to maximize the likelihood over uh, your training data set, which like before is defined as the exponential of your negated energy. So we're trying to maximize this energy. But now because we have restrictions in place, we can get the likelihood in a closed form. So specifically with the bipartite structure, it means we have conditional independence. So if I just quickly go to my notes. Um, okay. Just get a piece of paper. So we have this kind of conditional independence. So we would say that the probabilities of the visible units conditional on the hidden units um, are equal to the product of the independent probabilities. So we have the product uh, of the independent probabilities of the visible units conditional on just the hidden units. So given the hidden units, all the visible units are conditionally independent. And if you wanted to sample the visible units given, let me just flip back to my size. Actually, I'll leave that there. If you want to just sample the hidden units, all you would need to do is have to sample each of them independently given h. And it's, it's not like we need to factorize h over some sequential process. You don't need to sample from a joint distribution. You can just sample from a univariate random variables. Uh, so if I just go to the collab code here, this is just the same as uh, everything we've seen so far, but it's an example of a restricted Boltzmann machine. We have just our MNIST data loader, uh, which loads the MNIST data set. We can plot some of the MNIST data set here. Then we have our restricted Boltzmann machine architecture. And this just has a weights matrices of our hidden invisible units and some bias vectors, bias parameters. Then the sampling code just draws some samples from a uniform distribution. 
um, and it puts it into the appropriate form. So it's, we sample from univariate random variables. But then this is the nice part, the way we can actually sample our model given that we can either sample given the visible units. So this this basically samples the model given the visible units. And then we have the probabilities of the hidden units conditional on the visible units. And then we can just take a direct sample of this without having to factorize it in some iterative process. So we get our, our output probabilities and our, our sample of the hidden units given the visible units. And then we similarly have the exact same thing to sample the hidden units conditional on the, sorry, to sample the visible units conditional on the hidden units. So if we, this gives the probability of the visible units conditional on our hidden inputs, and we can take a sample from those probabilities, which is just a univariate uh, sample from a uniform distribution. <laughs> okay, so if I just flip to my notes now, um, basically, this, this shows us how we can take a, um, a sample of our visible units, conditional on the hidden units. So similarly, we can also say we can also get the probability of the hidden units conditional on the visible units, um, which is the probability of the hidden units conditional on the visible units is equal to the, again, a product of the independent probabilities of the hidden units. So we say probability of the hidden units. Um, Sorry, let's just say this is J, and this would be V I here. Um, conditional on just V, so conditional on just the visible units. Okay, so training restricted Boltzmann machines and also deep Boltzmann machines, DBMs, is basically just doing this whole thing a bunch of times. So we want to maximize the log likelihood of our visible units. So I would say um, we would just update our weights of the neural network, so weights vector. Um, we would move our weights a little bit in the negative direction of the gradient. So if we move our update our weights from our previous weights a little bit by say alpha. T, that's meant to be an alpha, sorry. T minus one. Um, a little bit in the negative gradient. So we'd have uh, Jacobian of the log likelihood with respect to our weights. So that would be respect to our weights vector. So how do we compute this log likelihood with respect to our weights? Um, so we would say the log likelihood P of our visibles with respect to our weights. Try and make that nice and bold. Um, and that's just equal, or you should say the derivative of the log likelihood with respect to our parameters W is the sum of two expectations. So um, basically we'd have two expectations. The first one would be uh, is with respect to the distribution of the hidden units. So we would say uh, VI and HJ is with respect to the hidden units, uh, conditional on the visible units. And then we would minus, uh, we've just seen this conditioning independent. And it's, it's, tri it's trivial. And there's a closed form to compute this with like two lines of PyTorch, I should say. Uh, I'll just show you in a sec. The second distribution um, is much more troubling, but basically it's H, J. This is our hidden units. But we need, we, it's much more troubling because we need actually the joint distribution here um, of, the, of the hidden units and, and, the, and the visible units together. And we don't really know this joint distribution here. We, we don't know this, so we have to approximate it, and we, we need to use like a Monte Carlo Markov chain to do so, approximating the max likelihood algorithm. So the Mon Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm iterates k times, which converges to disjoint distributions, so we need to basically break this part up um, in training, and at each iteration it samples from uh, v given h, and then it also samples from h given v, and in practice, we, we often I mean, just kind of iteratively apply this to, to, to compute this. So we need to iterate, iterate to get this joint distribution here. So if we just look at the Colab code to where this is done. You'll see um, when, when we actually do our training here in the forward pass, we need this Markov chain Monte Carlo approximation. 
um, where normally we would iterate k times, and you can actually just for a lot of applications just set k equals one. But you need to um, basically sample from um, given your hidden units, get the divisibles, and given your visible units, get your hidden units, and, and basically iterate here to, to get that approximation of the joint distribution between the hidden and the visible units. So if we if we put this all together now, um, we we basically define our losses here and draw samples from our, our model. Um, and over time, you see it starts to learn the joint distribution of the data, and you can see it's quite it's not so blurry. Again, it's quite a traditional model, but it's interesting to see how these samples end up looking quite kind of crisp, which is different to what you would normally get. Okay, score-based generative modeling is also, like contrastive divergence, a way to eliminate the intractable second part, that difficult part where we have to sample from the model. Um, but it also provides a, a measure of the distance between the model distribution and the target distribution, and I'll explain it over the next couple of slides. So if you look at the score function here, uh, it's important to notice that this gradient is not with respect to the parameters of the network, but rather it's with respect to x. And this allows us to follow the gradient in what's called Langevin dynamics, according to any prior distribution to generate new samples. So what is Langevin dynamics? Well, it's really just gradient descent, but with a little bit of Brownian motion. So if we just draw the equation, click to my notes. Um, Basically, we have a stochastic differentiable equation, or an STE. So dxt equals, uh, basically, we have, um, we go down the gradient, this delta, delta u, uh, delta u of xt, sorry, my pencil's running out of dt. And then we add a little bit of, uh, a little bit of Brownian motion, or a little bit of random sort of noise. So it is a 2 uh, t BT. Um, it's just a little bit of random noise, it's a little bit of brand, brand new motion. And if you put this together with our uh, Monte Carlo approach, we now have a, a really nice way to, gener to, to generate uh, samples from our model in this kind of iterative process. This is how you would do your Langevin dynamics updates. You would, you would say your uh, your, your axes are moved a little bit in the direction of the gradient of the um, probabilities of your previous axes uh, with respect to x plus a little bit of this this Brownian notion, this little bit of noise. And despite now being able to sample the model with now with Langevin dynamics, optimizing for it for a contrastive approach is too slow. So you need to do hundreds, if not thousands, of st steps depending on the data dimension to get your data samples for a single update. So instead, we can use score matching, which is minimized this, this kind of squared L2 norm between the model and the, and the data samples. And this is known as the Fisher divergence. However, there's an issue, which is that the estimated score function is inaccurate in the regions without training data. Uh, but there's a kind of effective strategy, which is to perturb the data with noise at different levels. And then during inference, when you sample the model, you can actually sample from each of the noise per tube, uh, uh, from each of the noise per tube distributions sequentially with Langevin dynamics. So the bottom equation here just shows that using noise from a, a, a Gaussian distribution, uh, we take our x hat from from this Gaussian distribution. Uh, in, in practice, you you need to do it for lots of noise levels. So this is all implemented normally using like a, a unit shaped architecture where the noise level is annealed during training to capture many, many different levels of noise. And I appreciate this is quite an advanced last couple of slides, but I really wanted to just briefly cover it as this is actually the very state of the art right now uh, in unsupervised generative models. So, so this kind of approach where we um, denoise the, the, the data, um, allows you to generate these amazing quality samples at the end. And you, you don't really get much of the effect of mode collapse, but it does really require, I think, a bit of self-study to to uh, 
understand and comprehend his technique because it you know it's like a I would say it's probably about a second year PhD level approach uh, rather than just being able to drive straight in in this kind of introductory talk um, course but I, I, I do want to mention it so if you if you are really interested in this how you can get these really really high quality samples I would recommend slowly reading the paper and using maybe the Feynman technique to learn um, if you're not familiar with the Feynman technique it's where if there's something you're not quite um, sure about so if, if in this case I wouldn't expect many of you to really have the idea of Longevin dynamics concrete in your head so what you can do is you can write down Longevin dynamics on a piece of paper then every time you encounter a as you like read Wikipedia and watch YouTube videos about Longevin dynamics every time you hear another term that you don't understand maybe some Gibbs sampling for example and you don't know what Gibbs sampling is then just create a new piece of paper with Gibbs sampling at the top and, and then research Gibbs sampling and um, this helps you to sort of basically when, when you research Gibbs sampling you encounter more terms you don't understand if you can't explain those terms simply to yourself like you're explaining it to a child then just create a new piece of paper with whatever it is you're, you're stuck on and try and explain that this will, this will basically build a hierarchy which identifies the gaps in your knowledge and it's, it's a useful technique to, to learn advanced techniques like like this <laughs> so if you're interested in this um, it's probably a nice area to, to spend some extra study this is really the very very state of the art right now and these these papers have just come out in some of the newest conferences in machine learning um, if you there's a there's a nice sort of brief overview on this uh, if you, there's a YouTube video called on Langevin dynamics in machine learning and this is by Michael uh, Jordan who's one of the leading experts in this area uh, and the really interesting stuff in this video if you find a video which is called on Langevin dynamics in machine learning it, it occurs just after the first 52 minutes of the talk all right so that uh, I think concludes most of the content of this lecture again I appreciate that the the maths and the concepts towards the end are very advanced, um, but hopefully you now appreciate like the, the the stuff at the beginning, the way we can think of our our models as as this energy landscape where it's zeros where the manifold is, and how we want to sample from uh, everywhere else, and we want to do our gradient descent on the inputs to fall nicely into the valley regions of this manifold. That's really a that the main concept I want to to get across in this lecture. And the fact that we can do it with multiple gradient descent steps, say 30 or a thousand even steps, allows us to uh, get very, very high quality samples from our model. And if you look at the state of the art approaches like this, um, uh, this, this paper here, this denoising diffusion probabilistic models, you'll see that they tend to, they have like a unit shaped architecture where you have noise as inputs and then you slowly denoise, then you take the output and you feed it back into the input of the unit. Um, over sort of a thousand steps and you have to do that a thousand times just to get one sample from your model so it's quite slow to to generate the samples but the samples you get are very very high quality and the real state of the art now has has got that a thousand steps down to sort of 30 steps or so these are very very new papers which have just come out in the last couple of weeks so this is really like at the pinnacle of of state of the art in generative models all right so that concludes this lecture i hope you have a good week